All right, um, so it's five past. Welcome all to another Dementia Open Forum. Um, I mean, it's September now, so the previous one I think we had in June, so hope we had a good summer. And as you know, we usually have external speakers uh, presenting, but um, unfortunately our external speaker couldn't make it for this one. So um, you have me today presenting to you uh, some of our research, and it's a a talk I gave at the hospital for uh, their dementia fair. And um, yeah, I hope you find it interesting. As always, we keep you muted until the end of the talk. And then I'm very happy for you to either type questions in the chat or to come on and ask your question in person. So let's get started then. Um, here we go. So um, I, I will talk about getting lost in um, or missing in dementia. Is it something to be concerned about? And um, so we start with a very generic overview. First, the dementia background. And most of you will know these numbers that there is a, a lot of people are living with dementia now in the world. And these numbers are really meant to triple um, so the vast majority of those would be actually in the developing countries where the aging population is only starting. The other thing is, of course, the, the different types of dementia. Uh, and again, I mentioned this very often. And dementia is this kind of umbrella term where the most common form is Alzheimer's disease, accounting for around 60 to 70 percent of all people with dementia. Then vascular dementia, well, people um, will around 10 to 20 percent. Some people have a combination of these, which is confusingly called mixed dementia, uh, as if it's all mixed up, but essentially it's Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. And um, then you have frontotemporal dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies, which are much rarer forms of dementia. And this is at the moment, uh, well, this is 2023 data for uh, how many uh, people of the population live with dementia in the UK. And what you can see, the, the kind of uh, these kind of orange tones give you the higher, the darker the shade, the higher the percentage. And then this cyan type color is the highest percentage. And what you can see, if we're in the east of England, live in an area with has lots of people with dementia especially in North Norfolk, uh, but uh, also here in Suffolk. And then the South Coast as well has uh, the highest percentage of people in terms of the population living with dementia. So we have clearly also a local kind of issue. Now, spatial disorientation in dementia, it's a symptom which people very often don't talk about. Um, and it's a lot about memory problems and people having problems with their memory, but actually being spatially disorientated is very, very common in people with dementia, in particular those with Alzheimer's disease. And apologies for this complex brain picture. This is a paper we published a few years ago, but essentially the brain regions in yellow, which you can see how, which are really affected by Alzheimer's disease are also really important for our navigating. So if we're navigating through space, uh, then these brain areas all interact with each other. So because they're affected by the disease early on, people get very often disorientated as well. But that's very often not noticed by the families, maybe because they, they go along with family or uh, it's, they just have a short moment where they're unsure where they are. But it can lead to much more serious consequences that people with dementia get lost or go missing in unfamiliar and familiar environments. And um, around 70% of people with dementia will get lost at least once, and uh, some get lost multiple times. Now, the reason why not more of those get lost is that very often people are not uh, allowed anymore out alone uh, when after they've gone missing for the first time. Around 40,000 people with dementia go missing for the first time every year in the UK. And unfortunately, many people come to harm or even die when getting lost. Uh, and that's what we always say is that you do not die of your memory symptoms, but you can literally die of your spatial disorientation. 
the reason why people might come to harm or even die is mostly because of exposure to the natural elements or dehydration. So that's why the highest rate of harm or death is also either in, in um, winter or summer when it's either coldest or hottest. At the same time, get, getting lost episodes create some of the highest carer stress. So there's a good literature on that, which really shows that for the carers is extremely stressful. Not knowing where that person is and uh, where they have gone to. And if people have these getting lost episodes, they can lead to a sevenfold increase in care admissions. So people are admitted to care homes because the families or the carers says we cannot cope anymore with these episodes. And they need to be in a much more protective environment. So what are warning signs for getting lost? And these can be uh, typical warning signs, which the Alzheimer's Association in the US has published, uh, like the return late from a regular walk, uh, or forgets how to get to familiar places, or talks about fulfilling formal obligations, like I'm going to work or has difficulty locating familiar places like the bathroom, bedroom, or dining room in their own house. And 70% uh, of carers are surprised by the first going missing event and find it one of the most stressful symptoms. And it's very common, the sentence they say, you just turn around and they're gone and they do not know where the person is, where they have gone to. And that uh, can make it very stressful, of course, to then start looking for them not knowing where they are and if they're okay. Now, which situations are most common for people with dementia to get lost? And there are really four main situations for people to get lost with dementia. Uh, one is which is called remain in location. And that's usually waiting for the carer at an agreed location at home or in the community. So the classic example is uh, People go out, for example, into town, and the carer says, uh, just wait out here. I'm just popping into the supermarket and getting some milk. And they come back out, and the person with dementia is gone. Now, remaining location is a combination of memory problems and disorientation, because very often the person with dementia might have forgotten that they're meant to wait, and then they walk off, and then they get lost. So it's a combination of those two symptoms. The other is routine outings. So these are walks within the familiar neighborhood, such as taking the dog for a walk or driving to familiar locations or going to the corner shop to pick up the paper, these um, classic routine outings. And one day the person doesn't return from that routine outing and you don't know where they are. Then the other situation is at nighttime. That is when uh, the person with dementia leaves home when the carer is asleep, um, which of course is very difficult because if you wake up in the morning and they might be gone for a long, long time. But even this cannot only happen at nighttime, but even in the afternoon, if they take an afternoon nap and the person just leaves the house without you knowing. And the final one is agitation. So leaving home when highly agitated. And that's um, mostly common when either if, if there's, for example, an argument um, between the carer and the person with dementia. Or it can be that the person gets confused and thinks that they need to go home or they need to go to their work and get highly agitated and leave the house. Of those four situations, really the first two are the most common ones. Around three quarters of all uh, missing episodes with people with dementia are really those two, so they remain in location and routine outing. So those are really the ones you need to be very much concerned about. And it's interesting that both of them are when the person with dementia is already outside of the home, but the less common occurrence is when they're inside of the home and then leave. So we did some studies over several years looking at this, the factors determining getting lost episodes. And we worked together with, for example, the Norfolk Constabulary, and we were given access to the Norfolk Police Missing Dementia Patient Records, uh, where they have collecting information on age, gender, date missing, duration missing, first time missing, the setting they're missing from. 
and whether they sustained harm and the location they were actually found. And what we found very quickly is that actually, sorry for this graph, this is we split uh, essentially whether people were in urban areas, suburban areas, or rural areas. And then this is the how many people go missing and where they are found in which distance from where they went missing. And what you can see is that roughly seven, so three quarters of people are found within two to four kilometers of the house. So most people stay fairly close to the house, so they do not travel far. But of course, clearly there are exceptions that people can travel very, very far if they take a bus or train, but it's much rarer as an occurrence. So most people are really found, we always say within three kilometers and within an hour of the, of the home or where they go missing from. The other interesting factor is of course that the majority of people with dementia go missing from domestic residences when compared to care homes and hospitals. And the reason, of course, for is that at care homes and hospitals, they have very often locked doors already. And they have, of course, monitoring 24-7 people, while in domestic residences, you don't have that. And there were similar levels of male and female people with dementia getting lost. But um, interestingly, men were getting more often lost multiple times and were missing for longer periods of time. We do not know why that is the case, and this is clearly something we need to investigate further. We also found that there were similar levels of people with dementia getting lost across all four seasons. So winter, spring, summer, or autumn. And uh, of the people we analyzed, 75% um, went missing once, 25 missing multiple times. And the vast majority of people actually were unharmed when they were found. So I hope this is reassuring that even if somebody gets lost and you get really stressed as a carer, uh, the vast majority of people uh, are found unharmed. A small percentage are sustained harm. Most of them will be dehydrated. And um, that is, of course, that can be rectified. And very, very few really come to a serious harm. The other question we asked, does the environment make a difference to where people get lost? And we were looking, for example, at landmarks, the amount of landmarks or the road network, whether it makes a difference how people get lost. And so we wanted to find what we call spatial hotspots patients go missing from. And what we found is that more complex um, street intersections were more predictive of people getting lost. And that makes sense if you think about it. If you have just one fork in the road, you either go left or right. But if you have a, a crossing with multiple directions, you can take more wrong turns, essentially. And at the same time, the more disordered the streets were, so the, um, the more tricky it was for uh, the more people would get lost. So very often in more uh, suburbs, you will have some organized, more organized street networks, while the old towns can be much more disordered. So the order of the street networks also makes a difference whether people will get lost or not. Now, it leads to the key question, so what can you do to reduce the risk uh, of a getting lost episode? And the first thing is just that to be aware that this risk exists. Many people, including healthcare professionals, focus more on the memory problems, as I said, but are not aware that this spatial disorientation is very common in dementia. The other thing you can do is complete the, a complete the Herbert protocol after a diagnosis. And I'll come back to the Herbert protocol, what that actually is. I will explain this in a second, if you're not aware. If you think there is a risk for spatial disorientation, consider interventions that prevent exiting from the house or allow identifying and locating people um, when they're lost. I'll come back again, what kind of potential interventions there are out there at the moment. So the Herbert Protocol. I think the Herbert Protocol is really commonly used now uh, across loads of different, um, oops, sorry. But yeah, the Herbert Protocol is now really commonly used across the UK it's named after George Herbert, who was a, actually a person with dementia in Norfolk 
who went missing and unfortunately passed away and was found uh, and passed away. And after that, uh, a protocol was established how to potentially find people with dementia getting lost. So it was initiated by the police and it's usually hosted by the police forces. So what is the Herbert Protocol? The Herbert Protocol is a form which can be used in the event of a person with dementia going missing or getting lost. And the form contains vital information about a person at risk that can be passed to the police. And the recent photograph of the person should also be kept with the form. So the family usually gets this form, completes it. You keep it in a place that's safe but accessible. And then once the person goes missing and uh, you, you're calling the police or even if you're just calling the neighbors to find, help you find, you can share this information uh, of um, that's in this Herbert Protocol. So this is, for example, the Herbert Protocol for Norfolk. There's, across the UK, there are different versions of this, but essentially it's the same uh, information which is collected and it gives some instructions here at the beginning. And then it just uh, gives, for example, some basic information for the person. And then it gives us ask for previous addresses in case they have moved and so to check those interests and personal history and further information, which some of them are very much, uh, you know, more, yeah, uh, very much based on missing person and general search criteria for the police. They also ask if they have a GPS tracker, which I'll come back to that in a minute. And then it asks uh, if they have any access to money or funds and uh, which basically um, then the police can check, for example, uh, cash withdrawals or anything like this, if they still do this. Or these days, of course, you can just tap with a card. The same with public transport, if there are any specific public transport they take, any vulnerability factors they might have for hearing, mobility, physical mental health issues, medication, and if they have any routine, uh, as I said, you fill this out before a person goes missing. So you don't do this at the time when they go missing, when you might not be able, but you do that beforehand. And um, then at the end, yeah, you basically have this information and then you can call the police. You can call 999, which is of course the emergency hotline, but the police also likes if you call 101. One of one is the local, uh, it's essentially a connection to your local police station for, for uh, non-life-threatening situations. And they can, in the first instance, they can deal with it quicker instead of it going through 999 directly. Um, and then there is a section of the Hyper Protocol which is completed at the time the individual is missing that there's a description of what they were actually wearing or what they had, if they had their mobile phone on them and or if they had a pet with them, when were they last seen, where were they seen, where were they supposed to be going, who is the person who last saw them, when is their medication due and other risk factors which might seem, you know, very, um, yeah, confronting in a way, but clearly the police needs to know that. And that's all again, common factors they're looking at. Um, and finally, they ask, are you happy to approve a media release? Uh, I think this is as well, if people really go missing. So this is completed at the time they're missing. So I think if I can really encourage you to get this server protocol, if you just Google it, you can find multiple version or at the end of it, I'm very happy for you to write us email, which we can put in the chat and we can send you the versions we use here for Norfolk or, or we can guide you to the versions if you're somewhere else in the country. Um, now let's talk about intervention preventing exiting. As I said, some of these are really that people leave the house without the carer knowing either when the carer is asleep or and there's a high level of agitation. So interventions to help prevent exiting sometimes is a distraction occupying the person with dementia. And particularly if they're, for example, in sundown, they get confused that they want to go home. Sometimes, especially in the more moderate disease stages, distraction can be really a, a good tactic for this. The others, of course, there are indoor alarms or door alarms, which you can buy online and you can fit them without any tools. 
to door frames. And if the door is open, so for example, the outside door, it, it buzzes or makes a sound. More fancy versions also have uh, that you get notified on your mobile if a door was opened or which has this sensor in it. So the outdoor, uh, the doors to the outside might be really helpful for that. What we've seen also loads of people use now these days is the smart doorbells. We might have seen them as well. These are doorbells which have a camera included and you can actually see what's happening. So there are motion sensor activated. So you don't need to ring the bell, but if you approach the door or if you leave like this person, it automatically records it. And of course, if you're not aware that the person left, you get directly a description that you know what they were actually wearing at the time. And then did they turn, for example, right or did they turn left? And this will already give you an indication where to go searching for them. So that's another good option to explore. And then some families go the whole way and really install outdoor cameras on their house. Uh, a few years ago, people would have seen this as quite extreme. But these days, of course, lots of people use these cameras already for security reasons. So it's very popular. And you can use that footage as well. And again, can have a look where the person went uh, or share that footage with the police if you need to call the police. Now, then interventions of identifying a person. So I recommend that any one of you, if you don't have it already, the Alzheimer's Society has these identification cards, which essentially gives uh, information about the person and any other information, and then a name and relationship and contact number of somebody if they're, if they're, they're found somewhere. And you can get that for free from the Alzheimer's Society, and you can put that in a wallet or in a pocket of somebody that can carry it with them. And if they're somewhere found, somebody knows who to contact uh, for that person. Exists as well on the internet, loads of ID bracelets, which allow identifying the person if you want to go down that route. And then there are other uh, schemes like the dementia safeguarding scheme, which was set up by Avon and Somerset police. And we've worked with them before as well. And they have either these kind of watch-like bands or lanyards or buttons which essentially, if somebody scans this uh, with their mobile via NFC, so when you, if you, for example, pay with your mobile or anything like this, if you scan it over here, you get the same like contact information for somebody if you find somebody. So um, that can be easily then, they can be identified and then a person can be contacted. That scheme has been highly successful and is now rolled out across loads of police forces in the UK. Um, it's a very simple and low tech to just identify people that are out there. And again, if you just have the lanyard or even this, then you can be, people can scan either a QR code or this NFC and can get the contact information of their carer. We actually did a study with the Avon and Somerset Police Force and looked at um, people uh, who were part of the safeguarding program. And that's what we found is that again, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, mixed dementia, those were the most common types of dementia going missing. People with frontotemporal dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies or Parkinson's disease, dementia were much, much rarer to go missing. But you can see not everybody has a missing incident in this program, but some clearly have. And for them, these safeguarding measures are really important. The important thing is we did a study with them where we actually provided people with these devices uh, when they had a missing incident. So we measured um, before they joined the incident and then after joining the incident. And you can see it reduced drastically the amount of missing incidents for those people. So it's it doesn't completely get rid of them, but it really reduces already uh, the amount of missing incidents having these these simple devices to use. And finally, I think I want to talk about the, the devices which allow locating. And they're the most, I guess, controversial ones um, because they're mostly these GPS devices uh, or GPS trackers. They come in various versions. So this is one which is very popular, the body system in the UK. Uh, sorry, this is the body system, um, which 
also comes like in a strap, a watch like strap, but then there's, it even exists in, of course, smart watches. There's, it exists even in insoles you can put in shoes or in pendants people can wear. So there's all kinds of GPS location devices you can find. Um, on There's a plethora on the internet and there's several providers for this. Um, just be aware that none of them actually have been really tested in people with dementia. It's one thing we wanted to do for a long, long time, but it's it, it's quite tricky. Um, but they, in general, they allow locating the person where they are, and that's on the mobile phone. You can easily locate them if they go missing. Now, the critical thing is, of course, that they have to carry or wear uh, these kind of devices for them to be able to locate. But if they're gone somewhere and you're not sure where they are, you can just get your mobile out, have a look, and you can see, are they there? And you can go there and pick them up. And of course, that's a very, very simple way of locating somebody if they carry the device. That's the critical part. If they leave it at home uh, or leave in agitation and don't want to take it, then that can be, of course, difficult uh, because it doesn't help you at all then. But if they have it, that's great. For some people, however, this is far too much an intrusion into their their privacy uh, and they feel they, and that's fair enough because uh, it's really, if you can check somebody's location or track them, that is clearly an intrusion in their privacy. I just want to make you aware of a feature that actually virtually all these GPS devices have, which we have found most families really like, that it gives them the balance between the people, the person still having a lot of autonomy and at the same time being safe. And that's what I've shown here. It's what is called geofencing. It's a very fancy term. But essentially what it means is that you can create uh, a custom geofence, which is a virtual fence in a, on a map. And within this geofence, the person with dementia can freely move wherever they want to go. But once they leave the area or go across this fence, you get an alert on your mobile and you're alerted that they have left this kind of area which you have deemed with them as being safe. So again, this can be a great, great way of looking at this. You can make it even more fancy. You can make routes along which they go, create a geofence for that, or you can just create simple uh, geofences for areas. You just make a big circle where they live, maybe two kilometers. If they go outside of that, you will be alerted and you will know then you can check them actually where they are. And we have found a lot of families really like this feature a lot. Uh, I remember still one uh, carer told me that uh, they were on holiday in Spain and received a, a ping on their mobile that uh, their parent had left the, the geofence and they could exactly see where they are. And they called the neighbor, the neighbor drove, picked up the person. It was no problem. Um, so it can be a really great feature to use without tracking where people are. But with this, they can still move freely in the area they want to be. But if they get lost, then you can locate them. So we did also some studies looking at uh, real world uh, spatial navigation. And uh, I wanted to show you this. So this is from our participants here. And this is a, you can see this is Norwich city center. This is a healthy older person carrying one of these GPS devices. And you can see how the privacy aspect is clearly, you can see definitely where they're living in which area of Norwich they're living. But you can see how they're actually, they're, they're going on routine walks within the area where they live, but they also go on further walks and went into the town center or went to a walk down here. Now compare this to a person with dementia carrying this device. And again, you can spot pretty much where they live. And what the first thing you can see is that they always stay in the same area. And they only went on separate trips to the hospital where we are and then to the shopping center. But you can see the difference that they're really staying already within the area. If I just blow this up, you can definitely see that they're just doing always the same routes and staying within the same area. So there is already a lot of self-regulation happening that people usually stay within the same area. And we analyze this and you can see this that actually health, these are healthy people of the same age than people with dementia when they're accompanied 
and uh, people with dementia when they're going out alone. And what you can see is that the number of outings per day, they're much fewer when the people go out alone, but even when they're accompanied compared to healthy people. The time spent moving per outing is also much, much lower. So they don't spend that much time. The walking distance is much lower. And again, this is reflected, of course, by these figures that they're staying always within the same area. And the mean distance from home. So they, they're going, they're, they're staying much closer to home uh, instead of traveling further away. So we can see again that loads of people with dementia self regulate already where they go and um, how far they go and how far they move. So it's clear that spatial disorientation is affecting already the everyday movements. Now, I want to switch now to this another kind of project. We still, we started a project and we're still running this with Norfolk County Council because Norfolk County Council, the social services, they provide GPS devices to people with dementia. And if you want to use it, we wanted to see how do actually people use those GPS devices. So we analyzed their data and what we can see is that clearly the majority of people are within this age range of 70 to 90, uh, which you know is not surprising because most people with dementia will be of that age. And um, the majority of people had a, what, a generic dementia diagnosis, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia were only rarely mentioned and it's just the records they have. Um, so very likely these generic dementia cases were mostly dementia, uh, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia like we found with the other studies. The, we also asked the people uh, where they actually used the Herbert protocol and the surprising thing for us is that the majority of people issued with the GPRIs did, did not have a Herbert protocol in place. So 76% and I think that's, again, just shows that not having that in place is really something we should have as a bare minimum. So I really urge you again to, to complete the survey protocol, even if you have a GPS, survey, but even if you don't have it, it's just, it should be the bare minimum to, to complete that. How long do people use these devices for? And this was very interesting. So the mean usage was 162 days. But some people did not use the GPS device at all after it was issued to them. So you can see this is the number of days people used it. And here there were quite a few at zero, pretty much, or very few days. So they literally were given this tracker and the person got home and they put it somewhere in a drawer and it was never used. Of course, there might have then happened an event later on and the tracker was never carried by the person. But for some people, they used it for a long, long time, for, you know, uh, year and a half. For this study, we just followed those people up. Of course, people use it sometimes for years. But it's a really interesting thing we want. We are, we're looking at how people use it. Why did they stop using it? Most people were either placed in a residential care, or they died, or they had, there was no response why they used it. And again, um, most people, so 84%, did not set a geofence and that most people did not know how to use this kind of geofencing option, which, as I said, is a really great option to give people these trackers, but allowing them as much autonomy as possible without following every step of them around. So education is a key thing. I think for, for the carers, it's really the risk factors for getting lost, which we talked a bit about. The Herbert Protocol, I know I'm, I'm, I'm sounding like a, a broken record, yeah. but if you can do that and complete that, then the interventions available for identifying or locating somebody or exiting, as we talked about, consider those and what to do when a person with dementia gets lost. And then the people with dementia, I think to make the person with dementia aware of the symptoms and risks. And uh, so they will, of course, very often we find this that the person would say, well, I've gone to this corner shop for 30 years. You know, do you think I don't know the way anymore? And so it's a clearly a very sensitive conversation to be had. Um, but as we know now, 
it is exactly those routes they've gone hundreds of times or thousands of times and still one day they can get lost on this route. The other is that to make the person with dementia familiar with technology, even if it's just using this the Alzheimer's Society card like a Caritas or use a GPS or wristband, if the person does not wear or carry their Alzheimer's Society card, GPS or wristband, it does not help identifying or locating them. So that's really, really important to remember. They don't carry it on them. So let's talk about now the worst case scenario that somebody, you know, gets lost, what to do when a person with dementia gets lost. Well, the first is try to keep a calm head. It's hard in that situation because it's very, very stressful, clearly. But remember that the vast majority of people are found safe and sound after a short absence. Most people are found less than three, two to three miles from where they went missing within one hour. So it's usually, sometimes it's literally that they're found at the next door, next, um, next door neighbor's garden or down the alley where the bins are or something like that. If you're away from home, so if you're in a town center or shopping or a church, call 999 or 101 to alert the police directly and ask the people in the surroundings if they have seen the person and have a recent photo of the person on your mobile to show the people on police. That would be great. It doesn't need to be on the day, but at least the most recent one, not old photos. And try to recall the clothing that they wore that day, uh, ideally. Even better, of course, make photos of the Herbert Protocol on your phone and then you can show that to the police. So this is another option that you can do. Complete the Herbert Protocol, put it in a safe place at home, but also make some photos of it on your phone and then you can show that on your phone to the police. If you're at home and the person leaves without you noticing, check if they have their mobile and call it. Check outside in the garden in the front of the house, the doorbell camera. You'd be surprised. Sometimes it was really just that the person with dementia was somewhere in the bottom of the garden. And then you just needed to have a look where the garden is. Some people have very large gardens, of course, that can take easily. You can you can need to look there. If they carry a GPS device, try to locate them to see where they are. Uh, or then call 99 or 101 to alert the police if you're unsure. The police are used to this. You're not a burden to them. They're trained for this. And this is really their key thing that uh, they do. Missing persons for the police are three main categories. One is children. One is people with learning disabilities. And one is people with dementia. So they are very, very well schooled, the police at this. So please use them. Then if you want, you can call or ask family or neighbors in the surroundings if they have seen the person. And you could ask family and neighbors to look for the person, but stay yourself at home in case the person returns. This is important. They might turn up still from an outing and didn't know what happened. Of course, for the family and neighbors, make sure that they stay safe themselves. That's really important. You don't want to put them at risk. And again, have a recent photo of the person on your mobile and try to recall the clothing they wore and again, show the police or people to have a protocol, either where you have it or where you have taken photos of it. Um, now, the final thing, if you are at home and the person was on a routine outing, like a dog walk or getting the paper but has not returned, check if they have their mobile again and call it. Again, a GPS device, call the police. And Sometimes you can ask also family, friend, or neighbor to trace the route they usually take on the outing, but stay yourself again at home in case they return. And again, have a recent photo, try to recall the clothing, show the Herbert protocol. Note for common routes, agree with the person which way they usually take. Uh, again, this might seem odd, but I think it's a good thing that you know uh, where they usually go, um, and that can be really helpful. Just to say, finally, in the final few minutes, that this also, the spatial disorientation, also affects our driving. And we had now several studies which we ran looking at people, at people aging people or people with dementia and spatial disorientation, how it affects driving. 
And for example, we did a very large study where we looked at, uh, we showed that spatial disorientation affects driving difficulty in people. And in particular, that they avoid challenging situations such as turning across traffic. Um, and what we can see is that this really increases with age, these difficulties. So spatial disorientation is not only when you walk out there, but also when you drive, you can either get lost when driving or driving situations like turning across traffic, which is a very dangerous situation, um, can really affect this. And this is something that we're exploring now further with the Department for Transport. Now you might ask, well, what about sat-navs? Sat-navs are pretty much in most cars these days. Can they help with the spatial orientation changes? And the good news is that loads of people use them actually. So if, if you hear people talking about Older people not using technology, that's wrong actually. Eight, nearly, you know, 82.5% of the older drivers use SatNav. Most use it for journey to a new destination, but quite a large percentage also use it for journeys along a familiar route or new routes to a familiar destination or backup uh, or when they get lost on a new route. Interestingly, individuals who use GPS, they usually have a higher number of driving days and trips per week and higher typical annual mileage, greater driving space and rate themselves as better drivers. Um, and individuals with spatial orientation changes who use GPS have greater driving frequency and great mileage. So there are in general, it really increases people's confidence and they're happy to use it. Now, what I've shown you now, this is really for people who are healthy and older. And we're running this at the moment now also with people with dementia, where of course driving is a very emotive topic in terms of when people uh, should consider actually stop driving. And we're check we're doing at the moment some research where we're looking at how this affects actually their, their driving ability or not. So take home messages. So spatial disorientation is a common and early symptom of dementia. It can lead people to getting lost or disorientated. Most common situations are staying in place and not returning from a routine outing for getting lost. Complete the Herbert protocol. I know I'm a broken record, but there you go. Consider identifying locating devices. They're highly effective on identifying or finding someone when they get lost. It's really something you should discuss in your families. Um, remember what to do when your loved one gets lost. It can, con it can come completely out of the blue. In most occasions it is. They've done the same route a thousand times and one day they suddenly don't come back. It also can affect driving. And again, consider using the sat -nav more regularly to get around these problems. Um, but again, we still don't know how much this affects, um, how these effects are really exacerbated in dementia at the moment. And thank you. And we have a stop sharing now. So we have time for questions if you want to ask any questions. Um, feel free to type your questions in the chat and uh, or come online and ask your question in person. And Dan, if you could put as well our email address again in the chat. Uh, oh, there you go. Uh, it's already there. And you can also contact us for any of this information we discussed today. So do we have any questions? Give people a few minutes. In the meantime, I have a look for the Herbert protocol. I put the link in for this as well. Hello. Yes, Ros, please go ahead. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm not a carer, but I'm an advocate for people with dementia. Great. Um, and um, one of the things I wondered, I don't know whether you've done any any research about when you're talk, talking about um, trackers or anything like that, actually getting consent from the person. Um, some of the people that I work with are aware that they get lost and that they are quite happy to do it. And I think maybe you're on a, a you know, a, a more successful time of not losing the tracker or leaving the tracker because they sort of do come to rely on it. So it's just that. And then of course, being an advocate, it's about 
as you pointed out, I mean, there are some concerns about um, uh, persons' privacy and um, the GDPR, which the Herbert Pope protocol goes into very well, doesn't it, about who you should share that information with, and that, if possible, again, you get consent from the person to actually create the Herbert protocol at a time when they're able to consent. Yes. But that was all, really. It was very interesting. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Rose. Now, I completely agree with you. Consent is very important. As you say, uh, well, as you know very well, it's uh, it's a very, when is the right time to do this? And yes. very often that's what we see, and you will be familiar with that as well, is that people think, I'm still okay, I don't need this. But it's yeah. actually exactly at that time when you need to put things into place for when things change rapidly and maybe they will not be able to consent anymore. And then you as a family or carer are in a very awkward position that you need to make decisions on behalf of your loved one. And that can be very tricky, of course. So yeah, I urge everybody to discuss it, but it can be very emotive to discuss it. So it's not an easy conversation to have, clearly. No. So Linda asks, can I ask a track controversial in terms of a possible deprivation of liberties? Yes, well, this is a question. Is this, you know, impinging on your on your privacy that it's nobody's business where you're going, essentially, and uh, your family might be watching you every step? Um, and that's a valid question. It's it's something you need to discuss. And we have families who are adamant that they do not want to use this because they think it's not appropriate. And others who are complete converts and think this is the best thing because everybody is safe. But it's a very personal decision. That's why I've highlighted this geofencing option, which we have found once people know this, this becomes a really good middle ground that People can still move wherever, but once they leave this area where they've agreed with the family, maybe of, on an area, then the family or the carer gets notified and that triggers then for them to check it. But it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a very personal question, as I said. It's, um... Okay, and Kathy asks, our road safety team at Norfolk County Council would be very interested to hear more about the impacts of dementia and driving in your findings. Yes, I can give you a whole separate talk on that. We've done this and we're talking at the moment. We're also talking to the Department for Transport and the DVLA who are very interested in those findings as well. Um, because as you know, there is at the moment, there is no standardized way actually of assessing dementia uh, the ability of people with dementia to do driving. There, is, there are driving assessment centers, but it's a very emotive and controversial topic. Most people are fine to drive at the early stages, but once they reach the moderate disease stages, it, it, it becomes very difficult to determine when they should stop driving. And so I'd be very happy to have a follow-up conversation. Kathy, if you just write me an email, if you Google me, I'd be very happy to talk to you and your team. That's a whole other talk. <laughs> right and then we have sam asking uh, thank you so much really interesting and good strategies to for what to do and how to be prepared we're saying that the norfolk county council of assistive technology can assess needs and advice and sometimes provide some equipment for people with dementia who are at risk of getting lost or go missing thanks for this talk yes absolutely the assistive technology team and we're working with them together. Actually, one of them is at the moment doing is on a secondment with me. So we're working really closely with them uh, because we we think exactly that we need to work with the services to make it relevant. But these teams are really there to support uh, their families. So reach out to them and they're great. They really know what they're doing and they can discuss all the concerns with you. Thank you, Sam. Right. I think if there are no more questions, then I just uh, um, mentioned that we have another um, Dementia Open Forum in November where we have an external speaker again, and she will talk about a, a care management program. So that might be interesting to a lot of you. And we will circulate the, 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 the times and dates closer to, to, to that time. But in the meantime, enjoy your autumn and um, 
Thank you for coming.